We're going to begin reading in chapter 2 and verse number 23. You ready? Let's see what God has to say. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? He said to them, Have you never read that what David did when he was in need and hungry, and he and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. He entered the synagogue again, and a man who was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent when they had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out. His hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Let's bow to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for uh, this day, a day that we have set aside to give you honor and glory and praise. Now, Lord, every day, every moment of the day, we breathe because you give us breath. We live because you give us the ability to continue forward. You are Lord of all. You love all, and you keep us all. You are holy, holy, holy. The angels do always sing of your glory and grace. And yet we so often, sad to say, we ignore you, high and lifted up. Lord, you're the God of time and the God of eternity. You sit highly enthroned upon the throne. Lord, one day in heaven, we won't have to have a sun to shine. You will be the light. Jesus, you are the light of my heart and my life. You mean everything to me. Lord, I thank you that we, your church, could come together today just to give you honor and glory and praise. So, Lord Jesus, use these words, actions in your life, things that you walk through. Lord, I pray that you draw us close. Speak, Jesus, speak, so that we could not only be in your praise and glory, but Lord, that we could be a part of that praise and we could be changed to be creatures holy unto you. Do this today. Let us see Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. The Sabbath. The Sabbath. Y'all know what I mean when I say Sabbath? You have an understanding of what that is? Some say, oh, that's Old Testament. We don't have to follow the Sabbath today. Really? Jesus, on this particular day, in this particular passage, whether it is one day or it is a, it's, it's not always chronologically just one right after the next, but he put these together and there are two periods that have to deal with the Sabbath. Most believe that it probably was moving into the same. I don't know if you read Matthew 12, it kind of sounds that way. But just to understand this, Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath as was his habit. It was something that he regularly did. Why would he do that? Well, because it was good. Now, remember in 
Exodus chapter 20. You remember the, the uh, fourth commandment? What were we supposed to do? Well, let me get back here to it. Let me read it to you. If it's one of the big, if, it's, if it made the top 10, are y'all good with it? Okay. You shall not make for your, uh, excuse me, uh, verse number seven. Nope, it is verse number, number eight. I actually had it marked, but I'm looking, I'm, I guess I want to like a preacher. I want to preach all of it. Verse eight says, remember the Sabbath day. Remember it. To keep it holy. Remember to keep the Sabbath holy. Word holy means separate, but it means separate unto the Lord. He gave us something here called the Sabbath. Six days you shall labor. Do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servants, nor your female servants, that's big, we'll talk about that in a moment, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is with, within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now that was important. They had just come out of Egypt, slavery in Egypt. They had just spent 400 years of not having a day off. If the sun came up, they worked. They were slaves. 400 years. So when did they keep this understanding of God? They didn't have all the written words down yet, but it was carried down from one to the next, from generation to the next. They would gather together because they were slaves in the evening time around the fire or the families would get together and, and they would come together and share the stories. Now, at the end of slavery all day, you're pretty tired. That would have been a great time for an amen, right? I mean, you work all day, you're tired. What do you normally want to do when you're tired? Nothing. Can I say nothing? Just let me see it. We get the twitch with that thing in our hand. We turn the channels and we do nothing, praise God. But he said to the children of Israel after they came out of slavery in Egypt and they're there, and he, God is going to now give them, God himself is speaking to them through Moses and they're putting the commandments out there that are blessings for them, separate unto the Lord. And the fourth commandment was, hey guys, we're going to work six days. On the seventh day, rest unto the Lord. A hallowed day unto the Lord. Separate it off for Him. Stay out of the fields. By the way, don't let your female servants or your male servants, don't let them work. Don't even let the cattle work. Let them eat it up and let them rest. Because this is the way. And when God made the world, He made it in six days. And on the seventh day, He rested. Rested. Holy unto the Lord. Holy unto the Lord. Why? So they would not forget the relationship with Him. Rest unto the Lord. I uh, had a person who was acting very, um, like they knew, they had this, they had the Word of God down and they knew every little intent of it. And they said, you're only supposed to rest. And I said, unto the Lord. No, pastor, you're only supposed to rest. I said, you're missing it. I've had people quote this to me. I can rest anywhere. Ronnie, I can rest with a fishing rod in my hand. So they go and worship at the lake. I don't have to be in that building to worship. Well, let me tell you who's in the building today. The church. The church is to be separated unto the Lord. So we are God's hallowed holy people. And God put a day. Now we do it on Sunday, the first day of the week, not Saturday, which was the Sabbath day for them. But we do it because our Lord was resurrected on Sunday. Sunday, so we serve a risen Savior and we celebrate the resurrection, but we still come together. We are the body of Christ. We hallow this unto the Lord. It's an important day. 
The, Sab the Sabbath, though, in Jesus' day, had become again another day of slavery, of rules, of regulations, what you can do, what you can't do. But the commandment was to set us free, not to bind us down, but freedom to walk with God, close to God, to worship God in spirit and in truth. I'm supposed to love the Lord my God, come on, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you are going to have a day hallowed unto the Lord, and we are supposed to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength, but we're going to make us God of that day, and we'll do what we want, and, and we, we'll, we're not going to do it unto the Lord, we're going to do it unto us, because in our generation, come on, listen to me now, we have made the things of this world about us. What, how it makes us feel, what we want to do. And if not careful, we'll add it to the, all the other lists where we forget God and we only place ourselves. If we do that, listen to me, we will become the idol. We will start to sit on the throne of our life. We'll be, we will decide what we will do and what we won't do. That's a sad place, and it will take you to a terrible place. Now, there were two extremes that have, have, we, we see here. We see all these people, all these uh, that were bound down by all the rules and regulations, and then we see the other group that just give lip service adherence while ignoring, come on, true worship. Um, when we get to heaven, we are going to worship. Matter of fact, it is going to be the breath of glory is giving God praise. We sang this morning the song, the angels, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Revelation, the same things, the angels are there. They cannot help it. When they're in the presence of God, something come out comes out of them that is worship. It is true in their life. It is respect. It is love. And they separate themselves unto Him. Why should we do less? The greatest failure in the church today is shabby preaching, come on, and no worship. Lip service, but not heart service. The need for people today is to be brought into the presence of God where the Word of God can take its rightful place of leading us to the feet of Jesus. Well, it wasn't being done. So, here we see an example. Look what it says in verse 23 of chapter 2. Now it happened as he went through the grain fields. What's it say? On the Sabbath day. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. Now, let's put this in context. You, there was a rule you could only walk so far on the Sabbath day. You could only take so many steps. If you exceeded that, you were breaking the commandments of the Sabbath. So they would have to travel close to synagogue if they wanted to go to synagogue. So they get up and they're going to synagogue and they're hungry. Now, the grain fields were out there and there would always be a path through the grain field, just a road, so to speak, a, a walking path. And it was legal, come on, it was good, it was allowed. If you were planting grain in the field, you could, as you walk down the path, reach over, grab, grab some of the, the heads of the grain, and you would take this, and you would do them like that, kind of blow on them to get the husk off of it, and you could eat it. It was just for all the travelers that were there, you would always plant enough, so that any traveler come by could just get some, do this, and eat it. But the Pharisees were watching. And the Pharisees saw them grab the, the grain. Now, it's not against the law to eat on the Sabbath day. Isn't that right, Charles? That's right. Charles is my friend. 
I always pick on harm. Charles has one of these lovely diets. He only eats certain things, but he loves what he eats. Amen? That's right. Well, he saw him doing this, and that's what they considered work. To do this was considered work, and you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. You're supposed to rest. See, y'all got it easy. Amen? Well, they begin to pluck the heads of grain, and the Pharisees said to him, Look! Why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Don't you just love those people that are around there? I call them the Pharisaical police. They're looking just to write you a ticket, right? He's working. How many of y'all get cold and do that? You'd be breaking the Sabbath. You just have to freeze to death. Your hands would have to be cold. You couldn't do that. That's work. Miss Joe, you'd be in trouble. Your hands are always cold. Matter of fact, reach over and hold Broadus's hand. Stay warm. They looked at that and they, they acted if the person had no value. It didn't matter about the person. The only thing that had value was the law. And the law was to give and to bless, but they weren't trying to bless. They were just looking for adherence. They only saw the rules. They didn't see the person. So Jesus gives them an example. Verse 25, have you never read what David did when he was in hunger and he and those with him? Well, this is actually 1 Samuel chapter 21. And it says here the high priest was Abathar, but it, it actually happened at a local synagogue where Ahimelech, was the priest that was there. David came in. He was running from Saul. He was hungry. And he goes in and says, do you have anything to eat? Well, the priest would take bread and they would bake bread. Can you just smell it? Hot bread. And they would put out the hot bread. And they take the other bread. And then the priest could eat it. It was for the priest. See, the priest got the leftovers. They got to eat weak old bread. But it was nothing they complained about. They were grateful for it. But I love this picture here. Who got the best? God did. Now, it sat there all week, and the smell would be wonderful and all that. Don't you know they said, well, I'm hungry. I'd rather have the hot bread than the weak old bread. No, 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 no. Holy Unto the Lord. They were strict about it. God deserves our best. Would y'all agree? Our very best. We should give Him the first. We should not infringe on that. It should be our joy. It would be our joy just to get the leftovers of it. Amen? So He says, hold on. All I've got is the common bread. Let me have some of that then. You're not a priest, but... You're hungry. So here you go. By the way, it cost him his life. Not David's life, but the priest who gave it to him. But he was doing it in love. David mattered. Ahimelech saw something in David and said, let's do this for him. I call this common sense Christianity. But Jesus says, don't you understand that the value of people are more important? The law is there to bless, but you're making it to be something limiting to, to hurt the people, not bless the people. Then he says in verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made to bless you, not just simply something that you had to do unto the Lord. It was to bring you with love to the Lord. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Lord of the Sabbath. We are to love the Lord and keep Him. I think this is one of the most broken of the commandments. I think it's one of the most overlooked of the commandments. <clears throat> well, let's see what Hebrews has to say about it. Y'all ever heard of Hebrews written to the Jewish people? And he's saying to them there, you know, we need to do this right. 
Well, let's see what New Testament, people say Sabbath, Old Testament. Let's see what New Testament has to say about the Sabbath. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23, y'all with me? Look up on the screen. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forgetting the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another. You can't do that if you're not here. You can't uplift, you can't encourage, you can't pray for, you can't help, you can't have that abiding relationship with each other as we abide with God. <clears throat> but exhorting one another, <coughs> and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need it more now than ever. Christians need the church more now than ever. We need to be there to love each other to forgive each other, to encourage each other, to work side by side. We need to be a choir. We need to come together with all the voices together, all of the hearts together, one heart and one accord. When God sees His people together worshiping Him with one goal, with one desire, it is the ambition. It is the overflow. It just is the normal love thing that we have. We don't do that lightly. We do it unto the Lord. And for all the people who say, well, I don't have to do that. Listen to me. If you can't take one day to praise God and worship God, I doubt you're going to do it the other six. If, if you're too busy or, or you're too, I, I've got my schedule that i got to follow to, to come and be encouraged and be an encourager, I doubt you're going to do it the rest of the week when you're working and your schedule is strict. Well, let's keep going. Verse 1, chapter 3. And he entered the synagogue again. So Jesus and the disciples are they're walking into the synagogue and they're doing it again. And he says, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they, that is the Pharisees, everybody around, watched him closely whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. What's the last part of that phrase? They came to synagogue, but they didn't come with good reason. They didn't come to worship God. They're trying to find a reason that they could accuse Jesus. That person should have stayed home. They should have got at home, went to the prayer closet, got on their knees, and asked God to forgive them. They should have humbled themselves unto the Lord. Then they could have came and been a blessing. But they came with wrong motives. Their motive was them. How they may accuse him. So he walks in to synagogue that day, and there's a buzz. Every time Jesus was around, there was a buzz that was there. The Pharisees saw him, and he saw this man with a withered hand. Now, when the Pharisees <clears throat> saw, saw him matching eyes with the man with a withered hand, Matthew chapter 12, verse 10, it says that the Pharisees said this, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? I mean, they see him come in, they're, they're gawking at him. He sees this man with a, a withered hand stuck out. By the way, this man with a withered hand with pain, heartache, brokenness in his life, he went to church. He came with the condition that he was in to give God glory, honor, and praise. Amen? I believe that says that everybody else who has excuses needs to get on your knees and get close to God and come and be an encourager. As a matter of fact, if you see somebody that's got the withered hand and they're coming to, to worship God and everybody's clapping and they're... I'd look at that person and I'd say, bless my... If they can, I can. It would encourage my spirit. Amen? Well, the Pharisees, they knew Jesus could heal. 
They believed Jesus could heal. They had seen Jesus heal. So they asked the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Listen to Jesus' reply. He said to the man with the withered hand, step forward. Come on, everybody, look at him. He walks out there with his withered hand. He said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? Jesus has one motive, love. He has one desire, to bless. As a matter of fact, he is willing to take the whole treasuries of heaven that, have, that are always there. He is the God of yesterday, today, and forever. He never loses out on all the, the great wonders of God. If he gives them away, it doesn't take away, it adds to. He has everything, and all he wants to do is bless. What a God we serve. He sees a man, but listen, he sees the man. They just saw someone that could be a tool that they could accuse Jesus. How sad. Is it lawful to do good? <laughs> to save life or to kill? End of verse 4, look at that word. But they kept silent. What do you answer to that? What do you say back to that? And when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. Jesus ever get angry? Is the word of God right? Is that word correct? When Jesus is looking at those people and he sees the, how they're not worshiping God, but they're putting themselves and highlighting themselves over God, it stirred up something within him that we would say the outcome of that was he was displeased. I wonder what it is when we take God so lightly and we say, I believe I'll sleep in. I'll look at my Bible, but I, I'd rather just watch catch up on the news than read my Bible. I'd rather text with my friend about what we're going to do this afternoon than I would pray to God. You think we ever make God angry by the hardness of our heart? Do we ever make him sad? I don't know about you, but I would rather put a smile on his face than a frown on his face. So here he is, this man standing out there. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Jesus was asking him to do what he could not do. But when Jesus speaks, the power of God is with him. And by faith, we believe and trust and we act on the spoken word of God. And when we act on the spoken word of God by faith, we are able to do what we cannot do. Jesus commanded him, stretch out your hands. You know what he did? Now, I did that for about five minutes. When I just stretched out my hand, it felt so much better. What do you think for this man who had lived with this all that time? How do you think he felt when he stretched out that hand? You think he took holy hands and raised it up to the Lord? <laughs> do you think that was, do you think anybody else smiled that was in the room? Miss Margaret, would you praise God? Deborah, would you give a holy amen? Would something stir in your spirit? To see God do good? Is there anything better than being in God's house when the presence of God shows up, when there is true worship and people are drawn into His presence and God does good? You might even see a tear. You might even see somebody say, Praise God, hear him say amen. You may see something actually happen in someone's life. You may see someone encouraged. You may see someone get on their knees at the altar and let the burdens lay down and get up in freedom of life. God can do amazing things. You might see somebody get saved. Step into the new life of God. 
Never doubt what God can do. Understand that God wants to do good. That's who He is. He can't do anything else but that. He doesn't come in. He's not taking roll today. Let me see who's here. Oh, well, no, they're asleep. Well, they're not here. Oh, nope, nope, they're on their phone. And by the way, they're not looking at the Bible on their phone. And we talk about those people who have a glow on their face because they got the Bible on their phone and the light shining on their face. That's only if you're actually looking at God's Word in your heart. Magnificent things could happen. Encouraging things could happen. Well, let's see the reaction. He stretched his hand. His hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might, what's the word? I don't need to define that word for you to destroyed. We know what they meant, don't we? Well, let's pick up in verse 7. And Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. They left synagogue and they gathered down by the Sea of Galilee, went to the lake. They're there at the lake, but something happened. It says, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea and Jerusalem and Adamedia and beyond the Jordan and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, they came to him. So he told multitudes. How many is a multitude? A bunch. How much is a bunch? A lot. How many is a lot? I know. I don't know either. But there was a heap bunch, total of them. There was a lot of them. And they're down there. And what did they come to see? Jesus. The great indictment of the church today is that when people come to visit us, they don't see Jesus. They see us. We should be the living examples of Christ. Leave your frowns at home. Leave your heartaches and cares at the feet of Jesus. Somebody said to me, he said, um, Pastor, how can, we, how can we have one of those services where everybody's just fired up to worship? Well, I'm, y'all know my spiritual gifts to be a smart aleck. I said, well, you come fired up and ready to worship. I think it's like kindling wood. Sometimes to start a fire, we need kindling wood. Somebody needs to come. Uh, you know, and any dry kindling will do. You spark a... You get a flame to a piece of dry kindling in your life, what happens? It'll burn. Then what do you do? You add to it. And the next thing you know, you got a roaring fire. How many of y'all want to be kindling? Fire starters. How many of you want to be a part of the glory, the blaze of God? How much prayer? How much preparation? How is your heart? It's contagious, isn't it? Well, It says that, uh, so he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. I doubt I'm going to have a problem and have to say, Rick, get a car right outside the door. I might need to get out of here in a hurry before they just crush me. I doubt that's going to happen. I mean, Ronnie back there may give me one of them holy hugs and I might get crushed, but that's, that's about it, right? How long has it been? How long has it been? How many of y'all remember services that got so out of hand that because Jesus had his hand on it? Because Jesus was Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus was Lord of the church. He said they might crush him for he healed many so that as many as had afflictions, as many as had needs, as many as were depressed, as many as were lonely, as many as had... Uh, depression in their life. They pressed 
about him just to get a touch of him. Just a touch. Unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried out saying, you are the Son of God. Wouldn't it be great if we were known as the people that when someone came in under demonic influence, that they came into this place and they got a new influence in their life? Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. But they, I love this, he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I got up here and said, now y'all, you go, go, don't you tell anybody out there what's going to happen in here. If God showed up in spirit and in truth and you left, would you tell anybody? You better believe you would. If, if, if service began at 10 o'clock and ended at 11 o'clock dull, would you go tell anybody? Probably not. Oh, the preacher preached another dud today. You know, one of the things I think is interesting, on the Sabbath day, the priest had no limit on how many words they could say. But doing this was called work. <laughs> they didn't limit themselves. Of course, I believe in inviting by that and using many words with all y'all. Y'all just have to endure it. Isn't it funny if we are living it, we can't hide it. We can't hold it in. And maybe the, one of the reasons we're holding it in is because we're holding it instead of it holding us. I want to see a stirring of God in my heart. I want to see a stirring of God in this church. Y'all warm? Is it harder to pay attention when it's warm? Now, are y'all the same people that got mad when it was cold? Come on. Huh? Are the pews hard? Is it hard when the pews are hard? How many of you are hungry? How many are already thinking about where you're going to have lunch? I know you. I was you. If the Come on, preacher, you quit preaching. Give the invitation so we can get out of here. Oh, my. That's human nature. Are y'all good with that? That's human nature. But what we're looking for is God's Spirit that overrules human nature. These people went to the lake and crowded around Him in such an amazing way simply because they wanted to be close. They just wanted a touch. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I know you do. I know you do. Don't take it for granted. If all the people came to church and honored the Sabbath, how many services would we have to have? Would we have to work up the singing? I don't think so. I think we just enjoy and instead of the sermon lasting six hours, which it actually does and it just seems like it, it would just blow by. It would be like just a second, just a moment. Is this outdated? Are we old-fashioned? Have we missed something? Church, I think the thing that we've missed is we have forgotten that our privilege is to worship the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Whether we have a congregation of 125 or 130 or 230 or 730 or 10,000 or 8, it doesn't matter. It's an opportunity. I don't know how many angels there are. The Bible says innumerable. But up there in His presence, you know what they do? They worship. They worship. When Jesus met Paul on the Damascus Road, guess what happened? He worshiped. When you go to your prayer closet, it's you in Christ, and you worship. You can be in a crowd of people and miss it. 
Or you can be in a crowd of people and be swept up in it. What matters is he deserves our glory, honor, and praise. And we should give him our best. Anything else is out of place.